Welcome, 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 and a good morning to everyone. We are live here on Behind the Markets. Uh, good morning, everybody who's catching us on all of our platforms, on our various streams, on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. So good morning to everybody who's in our audience and whichever country you're catching us from. Uh, good morning, uh, as they say. Uh, uh, I w I'm trying to figure out which language, besides, besides instead of me just saying Jambo as usual. Oh, <laughs> which is <laughs> which is just which is just Swahili slang. Uh, good morning to you, Vernon, and how are you doing, my brother? I'm good. I'm wonderful, and uh, it's 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 a good time to be alive, honestly. And how are you doing? Good, good, Vernon. As I said, um, I, I'm really just looking forward to this weekend. You know, just really trying to figure out how uh, uh, what's it called um, the the. The experiment in financial literacy, as I call it, you know, giving Zambians, <laughs> giving Zambians 237 million kwacha uh, the weekend on, on a four day long weekend is going to be a really interesting experiment in financial literacy. That to me is going to be the best thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, so I think that's going to be that's just going to be something of interest to see. But now let's take a look. Let's take a look into the markets, Vernon, and what is actually happening today being Enterprise Thursday. We are going through our business planning, sorry, not financial planning, business planning session. We've had a few hiccups this week. Um, so looking at the market specifically first, we did see that the uh, the, the the Quacha did go through a pickup uh, this morning. Uh, we did see the Quacha pick up strength, uh, what's it, sorry, the Quacha picked up strength in the final session uh, just slightly. So we did see a pullback on the continuous losses that we've been seeing on the FX rate. That's actually quite interesting. But however, we still have seen continuing sell-off in general. On average, we've seen that the dollar was up 0.92%. Uh, the dollar, sorry, the dollar was up 0, uh, sorry, yeah, 0.92%. Uh, yesterday, that was an interesting thing for it. See, now, we did slow down in terms of losses. So I think we can now start to see that there might be some resistance if there is some interventions, we might be seeing some resistance. And if there is some changes, we might be seeing them continuously. That might be a good move for now. Uh, we also are seeing that the stock market yesterday did, did close negatively. Uh, we did see that Zanako did pull back some of its gains yesterday. And we also did see that Bata actually sold off a little bit yesterday, pulling down the index by 0.12%. But on the week, it's still up. Month, it's still up. And on the year, it's still up 9.28%. So we are still benefiting from seeing quite a strong index uh, and the strong market so far. We do see also that the bond market uh, did come in a little bit, uh, did come in uh, stronger uh, in Kwacha, but not in dollars. We lost it a little bit in dollars because of the FX rate still losing, but we did see a 0.06%. Yesterday was the closure. Uh, sorry to all, but unfortunately, the bond auction did close in a day earlier, uh, mainly because of the holiday. So something we always need to remember is that bond auctions close the day before the holiday in terms of bids. So uh, today is when they're doing all the counting and they're doing all the uh, reconciliation for the purchase of GRZ bonds today. Uh, we also are seeing that uh, we also are seeing that uh, yesterday we did see that, as I said, the FX rate did pull back a little bit. It is starting to show a little bit of signs of over. It's still an oversold territory. If we can actually see it, it's still an oversold territory and it's still moving in sell territory in terms of it. But we are seeing that even against the RAND, the RAND is still holding pretty much still uh, against the Quacha. That's the more important one for me because of the imports coming in from South Africa. Remember, that affects the, the cost of living for Zambians in general. Uh, we also did see that the GRZ bond index, as we pointed out, did move up 0.6%, down 0.17%. And also the interest rate also did still move down, signaling that on the secondary market, we are still seeing a bit of selling and buying. Uh, we are still seeing a bit of buying happening. Uh, in, uh, interest rates are up 0.7% year to date, but we do see that in terms of uh, dollars, bonds are up 10.44% and in Kwacha, bonds are up 7.99%. Uh, commodities market, we did see copper break through its support level. It's dropping low. As you can see, from about April, we've started to see copper really, really sink away from that 9,000 that we were hoping it would maintain that up. It did move up slightly yesterday, 0.18%, but it has been trading very weak. Uh, we did see yesterday that about 2.04% uh, year to date is where copper is. The, now, 
Oil moved even lower than expected, down 7.84% on news that China's industrial sector profits had come in much lower than expected. There were horrible, the, there's a decline in Chinese industrial profits by about 21%. So that has pulled all commodities down and there's high recession risks globally that are picking up. We're also seeing gold down 0.14% slightly, but it's still holding above 2,000 on fears of a recession globally coming in. Uh, we also did see yesterday that Bitcoin pushed back up to about five uh, five two five in terms uh, sorry five hundred and twenty five thousand it's back up above the five hundred thousand quacha mark in quacha I remember that it's 525,000 quacha for a full Bitcoin. Remember, you can define the Bitcoin uh, down to its 100th million unit called a Satoshi. Up 74.96% due to a low rally that happened yesterday, while Ethereum was up 4.6% as well. Gold in quacha up 0.09%. So you can see that our, our wealth insurance assets are the ones that did perform yesterday. So back into uh, our, our, our cross-the-board look from yesterday, we do see that bonds up 8% year-to-date, stocks up 9.3% year-to-date, dollars are down 2.2%, gold up 7.4%, and it is the, the crypto assets which are extremely and wildly volatile. I have to keep warning people, Vernon, because if I don't, they're always going to, there's going to be the day that one guy looks at it, says, ah, I, I thought I would go into crypto. I thought I'd just become a crypto millionaire. Then they get whacked the day that index moves horribly. Uh, trust me, you know that like from, from the time I've opened, I'm, I'm, I think from, from last year, my, my stuff is at a loss. I'm not going to lie to you. My, like my crypto portfolio is at a loss, people. Uh, it's simply because just this year, yes, it's, it's managed to do better. But it's at a loss. And that's why I keep it at 5%. I don't, whenever, every three months, I rebalance it back to 5%. So if it gets too big, you sell off some of it and keep it back. That's called rebalancing. So you try and avoid holding too much in it because once it becomes too big of, a, of your portfolio, you have too much risk across your whole portfolio. And risk balancing, okay, people, risk balancing, that's what we call the barbell strategy. Always operate on risk balance investing. Now, in terms of oil, this is where we stand so far. Uh, we are seeing that a a, the rally in the quacha has overpowered the strength, the weakening of oil, and there, sorry, the strengthening of oil net in the year and there in the month. So, therefore, we're expecting that the oil price probably will come down about a quacha, a quacha twelve, uh, somewhere around there when the ERB read on on Sunday. This is the last read that we're going to get. So, somewhere between about seventeen where to about one quacha twenty. The reason we say that is we read between the twenty first and the end of the month to start seeing how they are priced oil so this is what we're looking at now it could now the, the 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 question was always transport costs of oil are always going to be expensive well diesel prices were down and also diesel logistics to get diesel through that pipeline is also going to be cheaper so we should be systematically seeing the diesel prices uh therefore coming down as we go along remember that there was still mixed stuff in that in that pipe so now we're probably getting that 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 final batch that should come out. The proper diesel should start coming out all the way through and much more cheaper and clean. So this should actually help us. Now, we haven't yet obviously dealt with the with the new uh, pipeline coming from, Mozamb uh, from Zimbabwe. Uh, that is just something that is in conversation, but not as yet. But the expectation based on the market dynamics is that we should be seeing the, the, the pump price come down by about one quarter, one quarter, 12. Uh, by, the end of, by the end of this week, we should have that announcement. We have inflation data also coming in today. Expectations that that inflation data will probably stay below the ten. Uh, the the it, it's probably will stay below the ten quarter mark, uh, especially with or with uh, fuel and food. Remember the two biggest factors that push inflation these days are fuel and food. So with fuel and food prices both pushing downwards, the expectations that on a month on month basis we should start seeing it within the expectations curve. So things have come back into uh, the averages. Now, quickly looking at our four horsemen, sorry for the wrong date there. South African PPIs also con dropped consecutively for the ninth month, down to 10.6% year on year, meaning the inflation out of products coming out of South African factories are coming in with lower with, with lower rates of, of inflation. But the month on month one jumped up by 1.1% for the second consecutive month. So this is something that we should be concerned about. Uh, we, should, we, should, we should also see... Uh, that uh, crude inventory is also dropped by 5.05 million barrels. Again, we got that read. But unfortunately, also fortunately for us, is that the, the story of growth is actually affecting that more than we are seeing the barrel, the, the barrel sell-off. Uh, Italian, Italian bonds 
uh, went up about 3.2%, while U.S. mortgage rates rose for the second consecutive month, giving signals that interest rates in the market are still coming up. U.K. labor productivity up 0.4%, showing that these, there are parts of the economy, of the developed economy, that are picking up, while U.K. retail sector continues to strengthen, and U.S. durable goods did rise, but U.S. retail inventories also rose. That was something on the negative. Now, we did see that U.S. mortgage applications week on week were up 3.7%. That's good for the housing sector, and that might help with copper prices and keeping it resilient. But negatively, we did see that Chinese industrial profits are down 21% year to date and 19% for the month of March, showing that there is a weak Chinese industrial sector that will then affect copper demand. That is what's pushing copper demand down below the support range. So the main news stories that we did see, are, and we will go deep into a few of these, Vernon, is that we did see that the total the total investments in the capital markets for quarter one 2020, 2023 uh, we did see is up 3.04% while CEC did talk about a 27.5 a 27 sorry a 55% Re loan recovery rate will be covering that story a little bit later. The African Development Bank has signed a deal for five hundred twenty-five thousand dollars with the Africa FinTech with the Africa FinTech Network for a startup uh, to set up an Africa FinTech hub uh, uh, on and sorry an online portal that will serve as a one-stop shop for all fintech activities in Africa. So we are trying to embrace the digital revolution. And remember that we have also seen that our president did go into Zimbabwe yesterday to go and talk, uh, to go and talk about, um, uh, sorry, to go and talk about, uh, uh, well, to talk with our counterparts on uh, on, the, on the digital revolution. Our copper prices did plummet through the support range yesterday. So we did see that based on Chinese data and gr global growth data, gold prices rose with, were, and were buoyed uh, as a safe haven demand due to weak company earnings and economic data that fueled potential recessions, while oil prices dropped 4% on Wednesday, extending the previous session's sharp losses after a report that showed U.S. crude inventories fell as a recession grew as a bigger concern. Bigger thing that was also happening is that bank stress will likely be limited to smaller and regional banks, but it will cause restrictions in capital in the American capital system, while the U.S. Republicans, uh, the, the U.S. House Republicans, are set to now revise the debt ceiling, which will then take one of the biggest risks off the market of America going into potential default. That's the, that's the, main, the main concern there, because once America goes into default, it takes the whole world down with it. Uh, we also saw yesterday that South Korean legislatures passed the first stage the first phase of review of proposed regulations that would help the nation's Financial Services Commission regulate digital assets, which is mainly targeted at cryptocurrency. They have a booming cryptocurrency industry in, China, in South Korea. So that's been some of the major concerns uh, that we've seen. That, so that's been some of the major concerns for the crypto space uh, altogether. Now, setting into some of our deep dives for today. Our deep dives for today, one of the first stories, one of the major stories that we are paying attention to, uh, and we saw we just did miss it earlier uh, before we get there, is Sentinel Mines has actually announced that it had a lower than expected uh, copper output for quarter one 2022, sorry, 2023. Uh, but it is still expecting 260,000 to 280,000 tons of copper coming out. But unfortunately, it was heavier than expected rains that slowed down Sentinel mines. Even though they are now increasing the amount of trucks, they're investing in increasing the supply of trucks that will be there at Sentinel mines. Uh, so to try and help with output. Now, one of the first deep dives that we pick up here is that uh, Citizens' economic empowerment has actually seen a loan recovery rate that has risen from 27% to 55%. In the last reading that we got, Citizens' Economic Empowerment, this was back in July, had actually cited that they only had a 27% loan recovery rate and only 27% of loans were repaid. But after their name and shame campaign, where they went around on Facebook basically demanding everyone pay back their CEC, their CEEC loans, uh, we have seen that the loan recovery rate has increased by 55 uh, to 55 percent.
because of the name and shame campaign. CEC hasn't, CEC has embarked on a vigorous loan recovery campaign from, from July 2022 when it had a 20, uh, 27 loan recovery rate. Now it is reporting a 55% loan recovery rate as of December 2022, but it had a target of 80%. Now it has said that it's increased its staffing levels, it's put constant monitoring and evaluation, as well as improved de risking measures that have led to improved results. They've also been doing a lot of financial literacy training for the entrepreneurs. We've seen that recently. There's been a lot of financial literacy training in CEC for the entrepreneurs um, in order for them to try and help them pay back. And they've also been business development services. What I would probably uh, also would like to see is us go a step further in actually creating hubs and making people go through training programs for their businesses so that their businesses are able to pay back and help people grow through that. Now, I know a lot of these are marketeer loans. A lot of these are much smaller loans. And they're, they're different in that respect. But I think there's still a lot of business education that we should be trying to put a lot of people through to try and help this get to that 80% target. But it is impressive to see them double their rate of collection. Uh, that's actually something that we would find interesting. We will probably get Vernon back at some time uh, during this session. Um, we also, now the other deep dive, and look, I know that also speaks to improved credit culture amongst our people. I don't know, Vernon, if you're here, what are your thoughts uh, on seeing the loan recovery rate from CEC covered by the Money FM team? If you want to see the full story, go to the Money FM, pop over to the Money FM website. You'll see the full story there and catch it and read it. Uh, Vernon, what are your thoughts on this, on this, uh, on this progress? Of course. Hello, Vernon. Thank you. I'm just having a bit of a, a technique. Right. I think we've uh, uh, lost our brother again. So let's get back into. So let's get back to the, uh, the government. Of course, uh, is making strides to see that um, young people can have something on their table, something more permanent, as well as empower them. But I think. Prior to all of the amendment and of course the spending of monies in different packages and of course categories, I think that there should have been earlier a sense of you know uh, education. Like we have always stretched, education comes first when it comes to finance, and then you want to venture into you know accounting and spending the money and venturing into entrepreneur you know uh, in general. But ultimately, I think the mistake was. We handed out money first before we educated people how to make money, how to manage money, and how to multiply the money. And now we are crying foul because they are most of them squandered the money basically, and they have no means of returning <laughs> the money. The I know money. of a group when that actually they got money. The money. Uh, I think that was in 20, 2021, I think, uh, just just slightly before the whole um, uh, election period. Young people got money from. Um, uh, this particular area here, uh, Onza, um, uh, um, Levi, Manawasa area like that. Young people got and I was on the group and I was seeing them sharing money. Okay, you thank you for your participation. Thank you for your commitment. Here's a share for you. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, they had nothing in the coffers and they heard that the the new administration into government is asking to money could not have responded everyone quiet in the group because they were not educated on how to you know be able to multiply their monies back then i remember there was a program of uh, piggery that uh, one uh, member of parliament was you know facilitating for young people in the same constituency and what they were told the value to return the uh, you no program but moving forward for them to remain to the business and make more money and possibly now become independent entrepreneurs at the end of the day so i think the government should rather prioritize education and not prioritizing on giving our people money trust me the cdf will be a similar case every other empowerment program that there will be it'll be a similar case it's not a matter of mismanagement no it's a matter of education they will 
squander the money if they have no proper use and guidance on how to do that money. I know a consulting firm who, you know, uh, lobbies for monies and funds for, for at least the space of two weeks. They train you for two weeks. They look at your, your plan. They look at your strategy. They look at your projection. If it's making sense, if not, you will be taken into training their criteria you will be taken back into training until they they, they, they feel you are fully groomed to start up a, a business and to be able to handle their monies and i think the government primarily without any uh, pampering without any you know a sweetening of the of my statement the government should rather prioritize education knowledge on how to make money and multiply because we'll keep losing money to these young and people Okay, unfortunately, once again, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so Vernon is actually trying to stress the point that unfortunately we, we do go through cycles of loss. Uh, part of one of the things that we have pointed out before is that we should be actually targeting to try and help as many entrepreneurs get as much business education as possible so that they are in motion when receiving funds. Because I think what usually becomes the problem is that they're not in motion. And this is why I said if there's nothing on the ground by the time you've got the money in your hand, you are most likely just going to spend it. But if there's active things happening, which are demanding your attention and your energy, you are less likely to spend it. And this is why uh, one of the main things that I think I've stressed on is that all empowerment funding in this country should be tied to successful graduation from business programs, that we should try and make business programs available to people as easy as possible. And in fact, what the empowerment scheme should first uh, look to do is to maybe finance you into a business program. Um, so let's say there's, a, I don't know, a four, and I'm not talking about some, I'm not talking about MBAs for all. I'm talking about startup science. You know, usually the problem is that there's, I think people need to understand there's a difference between a business administration degree and, a, and an entrepreneurship certificate. There's actually a big difference in this. Entrepreneurship certificate is more of a training program. Business administration is a knowledge program. Those are different, okay? So I think this is where a lot of people may, may, may make mistakes. And the reality is that business administration teaches you to manage an, an already existing business. If you're giving people empowerment funding, they're most likely just starting. So startup science is a different thing. For example, Vernon, the process of coming up with a business idea, that is not taught in a business administration uh, course, but it is taught in a lot of entrepreneurship certificate and entrepreneurship, uh, what's it, incubators. They teach these things, okay, in those programs. So pushing people through educational programs before they access these things can also help improve the businesses that come out. Let me tell you who does this actually very well. This is done by the Finnish, uh, the, the uh, Finland's business agency. Finland has a model where before you access any funding, you must go through a two-year training program where they take you through how to flesh out an idea, how to build a business model, how to get product market fit. They take you through a lot of these how-tos of the early startup phase, how, uh, what's it, hurdles that you're going to face, and they help you de-risk your idea. What they found by putting education before funding is that 80% of the businesses are still running five years afterwards. 80% of them are still running five years afterwards because they just did a simple thing of saying education comes before financing. We go the other way around. We give you money and then pray that you, you will make it and then come back and then complain that we have a 27% uh, loan recovery rate. That it is good that the name and shame campaign has worked for them to recover the loans. The question more than anything, and CEC should not just be measured on loan recovery. It needs to be measured on job impact. How many jobs are coming out of the businesses that are coming from CEEC funding? That is the core reason because the functional reason of citizens' economic empowerment is not to give out loans and collect them back. The functional reason was to finance entrepreneurs where banks were not giving out seed capital so that entrepreneurs can create jobs and wealth, okay? So the core metric we always need to measure uh, citizens' economic empowerment by is jobs 
and wealth. How many businesses are coming out? How much revenue is that business growing? I remember the the um, the radical entrepreneur uh, actually po actually posted on his on his page once the amount of jobs that were actually coming out of his DLN graduates. That is the way you're supposed to measure this. He actually he actually put how many jobs have the total of his DLN graduates done. He also talked about how many uh, how many he also talked about how much income or how much GDP contribution that they're actually doing. So this actually speaks uh, to the way we're supposed to be measuring things like citizens' economic empowerment. Uh, and and I think. In as much as yes, this story is just about loan recovery, and he actually he actually posted it here. And I'll grab it. This was in this was last year in July. He had posted that two hundred and two sorry two hundred and twenty five million kwacha in contribution to GDP, and one thousand five hundred and sixty jobs were created by the graduates of his institution. And what that says is then how these things should be measured. So great, we have them finally collecting loans back. That's a good sign, but they're not a bank. OK, the, 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 the core issue with them is they're not a bank. And yes, that, that this is just one side of the story. We haven't gotten the full side of it. I think the other perspective is then trying to get them to, to now start to see. Venon, are you still there? Or have you been hit? By, have you been hit by the dark night we call this? Ah, there we go. We're back. We're back. So yes, uh, so now let's move into our next deep dive uh, before we run out of time. Let's move into our next deep dive. And yes, this has yes. got to do with the security. So I'm still here. Yeah, and this has to do with the securities market. We did see reports yesterday and there are just some, there are some figures that we just need to verify here. We did talk to uh, the SEC. They did talk about 25 billion quarter oh, right. in, uh, in, in bond trade. Now we did see that the securities market did raise up by 3.04% in total savings that are sitting in the market. Global, the global economic slowdown, global monetary tightening, debt restructuring, and, and the depreciation of the quacha put pressure on the Zambia capital markets in Q1 2021. And also high interest rates are uh, created, uh, uh, were acted as a better alternative than the stock market. So therefore, the stock market was not able to absorb as much capital as would have been thought. Collective investment schemes, however, did grow by 10% on quarter on quarter from quarter four all the way up to quarter all the way up to quarter uh, from the end of quarter four to the end of quarter one we did see that uh, collective investment scheme assets are now sitting at about 1.86 billion kwacha up from 1.6 uh, before so that's 10 percent growth that's actually quite impressive we also did see as well that uh, secondary that the secondary bond turnover did rise up by about 25 percent i we just want to clarify this number check out the story on the money fm website but they are different uh different data points that are showing that it could be 25 billion so somewhere between, uh, between 15 to 25 billion on the quarterly trading of the um uh, on quarterly trading of secondary market bonds uh from quarter from quarter one that's a huge amount by the way uh, so the bond market is very active on the secondary market uh it does appear uh, and it is showing that so the bond so it is showing that Bond, the liquidity of the secondary market is just that the number of transactions is only 1,800, Vernon, meaning that it's not retail transactions. That's the only difference that everyone has to pay attention to when looking at the bond market. It's not retail transactions that are driving the bond market. It's institutional transactions. Because when you break down 15 billion by about 1,800 by about 1,800 transactions, you're looking at close to about 900,000 kwacha per bond transaction happening in the secondary market, which is showing you that the, the, the ticket size or the ticket size of the bond trading industry on the secondary market is mainly geared towards second towards institutional traders such as banks themselves who are trading bonds between each other or other institutions who are trading bonds with each other on the secondary market. So that's probably it. And you probably you probably would have seen NAPS are probably selling some of its bonds, most probably, uh, obviously to finance people who are, are getting their withdrawals. So that's part of it as well. So we did see it, but we are seeing that the fixed income side of the capital markets and the unit trust business are actually leading the growth while the stock market, unfortunately, did not, did not grow as fast as possible. Market capitalization did grow by 6.84%, but the lead ones were unit trusts and bond trading. That was the main activity uh, in the market. Other big news, uh, which actually has come into attention, is that BRICS is now shifting into BRICS 
plus and 13 nations have actually expressed uh, interest in joining the new uh, formation of BRICS. BRICS being Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa to form the emerging markets block. Now a new set of them want to join, and among them Algeria, Egypt, Nigeria, already part of BRICS m &A. Sudan and Zimbabwe have also been named as countries that would like to try and join BRICS+. Plus, uh, this is actually quite a big news. The potential adoption of members amongst the new amongst the the new demands could uh, could uh, undeniably reshape the global economic landscape inherently. So now there are wrangles inside BRICS Plus that raise concern of now who will have dominance. Obviously, everyone there in BRICS Plus owes China money, so China will become the de facto leader of BRICS Plus. But it is going to it is going to uh, put a new spin. Uh, onto how the global economy operates, that all the brown company, countries are coming together. Yes, I'm using that terminology. All the brown countries are coming together to now start forming a block together. So that's actually quite interesting on that. Now, our chart of the day um, for today, Vernon, is actually quite interesting. It's got to do with mobile money. Vernon, did you know that the majority of mobile money activity around the world, when you remove China, China is the biggest mobile money market. I think you, no one can compete with China. It is the biggest, the biggest by far uh, mobile money market. I think they do trillions. They do 180 trillion. Um, they do 180 trillion uh, yuan worth of transactions. When you bring that into dollars, it's like 60 trillion um it's like 60 trillion uh 60 trillion dollars sorry 30 trillion dollars worth of transactions so mobile money payments in china are huge we cannot quantify how big they are but when you exit china and you start to look at mobile money around the world do you know that the number one spot for mobile money transactions vernon is Africa. This is according to the GSM uh, State of the Industry uh, uh, report that came out for 2022, which, which looked at all the mobile money transactions all the way up to 2021. And what do we see? There are 1.3 billion mobile money accounts around the world. Uh, 621 million of them are in Africa, my brother. Africa. You have, to, you have to be proud of that one. 46% of mobile money accounts are in Africa. Active accounts, 53% of them are in Africa. 68% of the mobile money transaction volume, there are, there are 53 billion uh, total uh, global transactions outside of Zambia. 36 billion of them are happening in Africa. And 70% of the value of the money traded actually happens in Africa in terms of mobile money. Now, the biggest spot for mobile money actually is East Africa, which accounts for 40% of global mobile money, uh, global mobile money value traded. So East Africa is actually a hotspot. Now, when we count East Africa by UN standards, we're actually also counting Mozambique, Malawi, Zimbabwe, and uh, Mozambique, Malawi, Zimbabwe, and uh, Zambia. They're also counted into East Africa. Part of the old UN structure was that East Africa included Mozambique, Malawi, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. This is why I keep saying we're already, we're already acknowledged in that area. We might as well just transition. This SADC thing is not working out for us. And this is the difference I've actually spotted. SADC mainly operates Vernon with banking. Okay, They mainly operate with banking infrastructure. While East Africa and Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Mozambique were mainly unbanked. And therefore, we rely a lot on mobile money transactions and the mobile money network. So it actually does make better sense for us to align ourselves financially with the part of the world that we already click with. Zambia is actually already responsible for 1% of the world's mobile money transactions with 250 billion, uh, 250 billion kwacha worth of mobile money transactions done last year, 259 billion kwacha worth of mobile money transactions done last year. Zambia is uh, was already accounting for about $10 billion worth, listen to that very carefully, people, $10 billion worth of mobile money transactions were done last year in Zambia, okay? That's half our GDP uh, in just mobile money transactions. So it shows you we're already responsible for 1% of the world's mobile money transactions. That's how much of a mobile money transaction nation we have actually become. That's our chart of the day that actually now spells that out. Now, 
Um, I don't know, Vernon, if you have any thoughts on that before we get into our topic of discussion. Okay, uh, so we will now get into the topic of discussion for today. Sorry, I think we have we we may not have Vernon in full spirit here. Topic of discussion today is business planning. So we're going to go through a few minutes of breaking down on business planning because we have been dealing with the growth mindset where we've talked about wealth planning yesterday. We are going to talk about business planning. Now, whenever one is building a business, um, we have, out of all the startup science that we've done and actually even just trying to build our own business and our own business experience, there are six sequential phases that one must go through in order to build the business that they're looking for. And starting a business requires that somebody goes through six these six interconnected phases which build upon each other. The first one is founder market fit. Establishing a found, found sorry, establishing a market, uh, sorry, establishing that you are a fit for the market that you are in. Usually founder market fit has to do with, do you have expertise in that industry? Do you have experience with the problem that nobody has ever seen before? Do you have an obsession maybe with that problem? Do you have a personal story? Do, are, you, are, you, are you a social fit for that industry? In other words, you've networked and you've built social networks and good relationships. Or is it easy for you to build relationships in that industry? If you're a social fit, then you probably find that establishing founder market fit. That's a very important statement because usually what happens is whenever someone builds something, they usually struggle to see, are they meant to be in that space? Are they built to be in that space? Now, obviously that can sound ostracizing to the, you must live, you can be whatever you want to be mentality, but that's a reality. You are meant for some of the places and some of the things. Um, you also do see that the problem solution fit uh, is also quite important. Establishing now that you have discovered an actual financially viable problem, not to discover a solution and then look for a problem for it, to actually discover a problem, study that problem, and test solutions out on that problem so that you can actually build a solution for it. Because this is why a lot of people build products that nobody wants. Uh, the other part that we've seen is also building team vision fit. Uh, in in, in uh, Jim Collins' uh, Good to Great, he talks about the who, then what question of being able to build a group, being able to build a network or a team of who, then what. So you must always factor in that your team must always start with who, then what. The next thing you want to do is product market fit. Now that you've built the team, you've established that you're meant to be in it and you've solved the problem. Now you've got to make sure that your solution fits what the market needs. So you test it out consistently by trying to send it through what we call the success model. So these are some plans that you have to do. So each of these stages, then at this point, then once you've tested that you have a good product, build a strong business model that can deliver this, this product consistently and allow this product to consistently evolve. And then eventually, once you've established a good product with a good business model, a strong team, then you build a brand and a culture around that. So your brand must now become a part of social culture. So that's what you want to try and have in terms of being, in terms of your business, building a brand that augments or impacts the culture of society, because that's the strongest way you can actually be, uh, you can actually have business sustainability. On the other side of this break, Vernon, we will then go into uh, breaking down some of these stages and how to look at how to build your, your 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 business planning around these stages and goal setting. And then we'll end by talking about the importance of strategy in this area. But we'll be back on the other side.
All righty. Getting back to the last session. Ish, we had a bit of a activity issue earlier, eh? No, we have, we have, we have, Vernon, we have. And we, 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 we haven't had our handsome young brother with us for most of the day. And hopefully we might be able to get your chip in a few times. So let's look at um, the next part I also wanted to show everyone here. We were talking about planning. The first step I always look at whenever I'm dealing with anybody who needs to look at, okay, what plan should I develop? The first step I always look at is where are you in your journey? Okay. So where are you? will tell you what your areas of priority are. And I think that's important. Don't, you see, a lot of a lot of us tend to try to build brands before we've built a product. Like before, build something useful before you build something that's loved. You know, I think that's the first step you want to be. And that's kind of how this business works. So this is kind of a growth pyramid that should tell you at each stage, your focus shifts. And the goal and those focuses will tell that focus will tell you what your goals are. So let's look at the bottom part, which is everyone here. You're mainly your perspective is Vernon, you're trying to deliver a core task. Let's think about here. OK, uh, before we start talking about building the Money FM brand and the community and everything, let's just put shows regularly on the on platforms. That's it. Let's deliver content. That is the plan. Just deliver the content. OK. So that's the first step you always look at. And at this point, usually you're alone. You can even start your business alone at this time. In fact, most of the time, they even advise you to start self-employed at this time. So before you even, in today's world, and this is a good thing, by the way, before you even start a full-fledged uh, radio station or a media station, today, Vernon, you can just start as a podcast, an individual podcast. And you just start, uh, what's it, distributing content onto your platform, just pushing out content. And from there, you can expand it. I love the best example of, of that actually is um, the Daily Wire in the US, the, the, the conservative mm -hmm. media guys. Ben Shapiro just started as the Ben Shapiro show. Okay, that guy was an editor at Breitbart. He's a former lawyer. He's, he's a law grad. He was an editor at Breitbart. He's been an author. And then he just went out there and actually just started a single podcast himself. Him and Jeremy Boring just started it. Then from there, they found other people who started connecting with it. Now they've built the Daily Wire, which makes movies, which has kids shows, which publishes, which has different tours. But it started with one guy delivering content. Just like Phil Knight started Nike with one guy selling shoes. You know, there's always that one person Genesis start off. People try to start too big. That's why the, the essence of your business should always be think big, start small. Okay. Small is your starting point. I think this is the mistake too many people make. They want to, they think small and they start huge. Okay. They always, they always try to start huge. It's like, it's like, it's like, you know, when, and there's a reason why when you're born, you start as a baby with very little functionality and you slowly grow into your functionality. Imagine if you were just born 18 years old, you know, that, that not difficult life would be trying to get used to all this complexity in your body. You're dealing with your, 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 what's it, your, your puberty system. You're dealing with your respiratory system. You're dealing with all these functioning systems. You're trying to walk everything. So it take, it should take you time to grow into your structure. So this is the problem. Everyone wants to have the top tier from day one, when really the first thing you just want to do is deliver a product. So just execute a task. So have a minimum viable product, just a basic thing in front of the customer. I loved when they, in, in, in Y Combinator Startup School, they actually showed you when they did minimum viable products, what the early editions of things like, um, what's it called? Uh, Airbnb. Airbnb had no payment functions. There was no search function. You just had just put a just had a picture of the place with the number you could call. That was the first website. It was a dusty one. But then they were getting feedback from people as to what they wanted, and they started implementing the new features into it. Okay, based on what were the most popular points of feedback, they'll do that, and they did rapid development. So a minimum viable product is like a skeleton, and then you start adding flesh to it based on what people are now telling you. That's actually the fastest way. It's called the tinkering method. Even Nasib Taleb actually says, you want to be a tinkerer more than a thinker because people who tinker are the ones who actually get a lot more done because they see a lot more of what's on the ground. They actually get a lot more of it done than people who overthink. No matter how much IQ you have, 
that's in your head. Reality comes from actually tinkering with things. In fact, Mike Tyson once said, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. Uh, because that's the reality. You go into the boxing with Mike Tyson, you think I can manage this, I'm going to duck and jab, then one, that one just hits you right in the mouth. Then you're like, oh, this is a different fight than I thought. So, <laughs> so that's what you want to do. You want to get through this phase of tinkering. At this point, you're just tinkering with the product. You're complying with the basic minimum requirements that the law allows you to operate a business. You're making sales and you're managing cash. This is all you're doing. All your business growth, your business mentality at this point, people, your goals, your structure, your focus, all that's essential is getting your product to improve according to the customer expectations, complying with the law so that you don't get taken out of business, selling the product to people and managing your cash. These four things, anything out of them is non-essential. Listen to me very carefully. The reason I'm clapping my hands is because us black people, when we're emphasizing, we clap our hands. Okay, that's that's, that's why you need to understand. When we when we talk like this, when Kevin Hart said it's the thug clap. When we talk like this, we're emphasizing. I'm emphasizing people that you must focus on the product, complying with the law, sales, and cash flow. Anything outside that is non-essential. Human resource wealth, it's non-essential. Okay. Focus on the essential because all these other things, whether it's HR management, image, this, what to what, it, it will fall apart without a product that functions properly, without, in a, without the ability to manage cash, without the ability to comply. Okay, so the second stage, now when you've gotten this together, now you want to deliver this. And this is still in the self-employed phase. You can still be self-employed. You then want to look at the goals you should be looking at. The strategy, strategic focus should now shift to making your business efficient. Before, you just wanted to get the product out. Now you're thinking, what's the best way to get the product out? What's the most efficient structure? My product, my service, my content, whatever. What's the most efficient structure? Should I be doing it on YouTube? If I'm doing a show, should I be using YouTube, Instagram? What are the main outlets I should be utilizing? Should I be cutting it into pieces and delivering it? At this point, you're trying to improve your efficiency. Your product, you're now trying to get the product to fit the market's expectations. So you should have hit product market fit. And now you're designing your business model. So before you were just trying to get a basic team together, solve a problem and figure out if you're a fit for the market, test this out. Up here, product market fit. Once you've hit product market fit, that's when you've got an investable idea. So and to, out of stage one and two, you know, stage 1A and 1B, that is self-funding territory. At this point, you're not even looking for bank loans. At this point, you're, you're, you're using your personal savings, friends and family, and you're using, maybe you've got another business that you're financing with. You don't use external capital to get through 1A and 1B. That's very dangerous because these are high-risk areas, okay? You cannot start using loans for doing, uh, for doing these areas. So your next one is 2A. In, in section 2A now, once you've established product market fit, now your, your focus is on tactics. Now you're not just focused on the product and the customer. Now you're focused on the environment you're operating in. And you've got to be tactical because now you've got to grow your revenue. How are you going to do it? Are you going to sell new products to your same customers? Are you going to sell old products? Are you going to sell your current products to new customers? How are you going to do this? So growth of revenue is important. Now you've got to be profitable. So you've got to do a lot of cost management at this point. And you've got to create sustainability. In other words, your business has to be consistently profitable and growing in profits. That's what you need to start delivering. That your, system, your, your business can now consistently deliver growth of profits. Not just revenue. Now it's profit growth. And then when we're looking at 2B, this is when we're looking at now enhancing your position in the market. So you're now going to start differentiating yourself from society. Now this is the frontline focus. Polishing yourself up for differentiation building relationships, peaking your order flows, and creating a lot of operational efficiency throughout your supply chain. Now you're going through supply chain or value chain management in terms of this. So this is strategic focus. By this point of 2A and 2B, you've now hiring. Now you're hiring employees. You're not hiring managers. You are the manager, but you're hiring employees. These are the, this is the journey you have. So you can see the strategic focus that you have at each point. Then in, ter in terms of 3A, you want to try and look at building your brand. I see too many people, especially in the age of social media, Vernon, we're, we're going into excessive brand building before we've gone into product development. So you're all hype, no product. 
And that's where the problem starts to come out. You, you, you want to avoid being hype, no product. So there actually has to be something people can buy and use before they fall in love with it. Okay. Are you of use to them? Before they, because they'll fall out of love with you the moment somebody comes who's, in use, who's, who's useful to them. Okay. That's like being a sweet talker mm -hmm. and you are not able to just do the basics of providing and, and protecting. You can't protect nor provide, and then all you are is a sweet talker, and then she meets somebody who can actually provide and protect, and then you start saying, why am I getting left? I don't know, because you are not useful. This was the reality. <laughs> this is the usefulness part. So the reality is first, be useful. So be useful. So you have to focus. That first stage is the product. The second stage is the profit. The third stage is permanence, establishing yourself in permanence. And like my teacher, Mr. Makure, used to say at school, these things come in stages, okay? So the first, you, you, you don't want to break the order too much. So go through the journey because this is the cycle, the way it works. So each stage will have its things. Then you can talk about building a legacy. I know from the beginning, that's your vision. So what you must have is a vision of what's, what's going to be in 3A and 3B, but you must focus. So think 3A, 3B, do 1A, 1B. Okay, that's the way you want to do it. So focus on what's essential. I'm going to skip a little bit of what I had here today. But one of the things you should get very early is something we call unit economics. Make sure that the money you generate from customers in terms of the customer lifetime value that you generate from each customer should be bigger than what it costs you to get a new customer. Three times bigger is actually the number you're looking for. So your customer lifetime value is the average value of a transaction from a customer. This is the number of transactions they have in a period and how long they stay with you. In other words, you're looking for your churn rate and minus, minus your costs, okay? Minus your, pro, uh, sorry, times your profit margin. You then measure this against customer acquisition. What's your cost of making a sale? What's your cost of new customer marketing? Divide that by how many new customers you get in a month. That is customer acquisition. So in other words, how many promos are you giving out, discounts, all those things. All these things measure. It should not, if you, if you don't have a number, if your customer lifetime value is not three times more, if you scale that business, you're actually going to grow a problem more than you're going to grow a business. This is the math people get wrong. This is one of the biggest keys you need to try to get right from the beginning. Now, I always, I wanted to just quickly focus on essentialism, but I'll leave this for next week where we are going to talk about understanding, focusing on the essentials. So we'll just leave this in for next week, although we've run out of a bit of time. I will leave you with my final thoughts, Vernon, whenever you're doing strategic planning for your business. Mark Zuckerberg said this, I'm here to build something long-term. Anything else is a distraction. So always focus on what you have always keep your eye on the long-term prize, but do what's in front of you. Okay, that's the business. That's the difference. While um, Jeff Bezos said, we are stubborn about vision and flexible about details. That's the other thing. You need to be a tinkerer. You need to be somebody who's comfortable tinkering away on vision. But Morris Chang, the Chinese businessman, said this, without strategy, execution is aimless. And without execution, strategy is useless. So always remember, you can plan as much as you want, but if you aren't doing anything, <laughs> all the best. <laughs> so always look at, always make sure you're actually doing things. So that, that's why... Always get to tinkering as much as possible. Put a product out there as bad as it is because whatever's in your head is not what's in other people's hearts already. So you need to first get what's in your head out, then allow people to then give you enough feedback to rework it or give you enough data and information so that you can work it into what they need because you are not a mind reader, Vernon. You are not, okay? No matter how much you want to believe you are, you are not a mind reader. So you have to get into the minds of people once, and, and the reality I just wanted to put is this, when you put a product in front of someone, that's when they truly start to tell you what it really needs. And I'll leave it there, Vernon, for today. I know we've had a bit of a struggle today, but I'll leave it there and we'll pick up tomorrow. Remember, I did promise that tomorrow I'm going to give you three things you can do with your NAPSA. You really want to tune in for that one so that you don't eat your money, people. <laughs> because <laughs> the, consider this an intervention. Just consider it an intervention. <laughs> I appreciate it, Tony. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Cheers. Have a good one.